Welcome to our midweek message for Wednesday, July 27th, 2022. This is our gathering of the Ecclesia, the believers in our risen Lord Jesus Christ, the body of Christ. Thank you for joining. Tonight's scripture reading comes from Colossians chapter 3, the first 11 verses. Here Paul wrote to the church at Colossae, So if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. In our Kingdom Tide series of midweek messages, tonight we want to look at seeking better. I'm sure Martha Stewart is a name with which you're familiar. Martha Stewart is the style guru for the last 30 years. She's had her own TV shows. She has her own magazine. She is a brand unto herself. And you might be surprised to know that Martha Stewart has a right-hand man. His name is Kevin Sharkey. He has been Martha Stewart's friend for over 30 years and is currently number two in Martha Stewart Enterprises. And some think he may be her successor. Kevin Sharkey is an unusual right hand hand man. Martha Stewart Living Douglas photographer Douglas Freeman had to move from Los Angeles to the East Coast and he decided he would move himself in a great big rented moving truck. Kevin Sharkey as the number two at Martha Stewart and Martha's right hand man volunteered to come along. And he brought with him some giant suitcases and some great big boxes and a couple of bolts of fabric. And Douglas Freeman said, when we got to our very first no-tell motel on our road route from West Coast to East Coast, Kevin Sharkey rolled out his giant suitcases and his bolts of fabric. First, he wrapped all of the mattresses in each of our hotel rooms in plastic. And then he wrapped them in canvas fabric. And then he made up the beds with freshly laundered and ironed bed linens of the highest quality, with high quality pillows, duvets, and duvet covers. He did that for every one of the workers and people that were on that journey. And he did it every day night until their caravan reached the East Coast and Douglas Freeman, Friedman's new residence. Now you would not think that some famous executive right-hand man would stoop to such an activity as making sure that every one of the mattresses that those journeying, moving people were sleeping on would be guaranteed to be sanitary, clean, safe, and comfortable. 
But you see, that's the kind of right-hand man Jesus is. Jesus is the kind of right-hand man at the Father's right hand whose primary concern is to pray for us because he has already taken care of the clean and safe part through his suffering, death, and resurrection. This is the kind of a right-hand man who isn't ever going to take advantage of his position and who is always going to be there for us. Well, as we look at tonight's lesson, Paul goes into detail about being raised with Christ. How, how do we know that we've been raised with Christ if indeed, in fact, the being raised with Christ is something that is in the future, our personal futures, and even in the world's future? Well, in Romans 6, Paul wrote, since we have been buried with Christ by baptism into his death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so too we now may walk in newness of life, for we have, through this baptism and through the promises of our baptism, been united with him, not only in his death, but in his resurrection. In other words, our hope is in Christ Jesus' resurrection. Our hope is in this proclamation that has been the rallying cry of the church from the very first resurrection day. He is risen. And he's going ahead of us. In Ephesians 2, Paul wrote, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which God loves us, even when we were dead through our sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And remember, that's not our own doing. That is God's gift to us so that none of us can boast on our accomplishments or righteousness. We have been, he has been raised up and we have been raised up with him. And he, Jesus, has seated us with him in heavenly places. In Colossians chapter 2, having been buried with him in baptism, we have been raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised Jesus from the dead. And in 1 Peter chapter 1, through Christ we have come to trust in God. God who raised Jesus from the dead gave him glory so that now our faith and hope are set on God. In Romans 8, for in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what is already seen? And Hebrews 11, we now have faith in the assurance of all the things we hope for. We have the conviction of all the things we still don't see because we hope in Jesus. And Jesus is at the Father's right hand praying for us, interceding for us. So how do we get rid of all such things? Well, first of all, what are all such things? Paul details them, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, greed, which is idolatry, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Don't lie to each other. Doesn't this kind of sound like a agenda for late night TV? Doesn't this kind of sound like the agenda for political discourse in America today? Paul is saying, get rid of all this stuff. Strip it off. Clothe yourselves only with Christ. In Romans 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be re rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. In Ephesians 4, Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in keeping with the truth that is in Christ Jesus to put off your former way of life. Strip off this old self which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Be renewed in the spirit of your minds. And in Ephesians 4 again, Therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully with your neighbor for we are all members of one another. We belong to each other. We belong to Christ. 
and together we become the living body of Christ, the ecclesia. Then what is this thing that Paul talks about, the renewal in the image of the Creator? How, how does that happen? How do our minds and our hearts and our lives become spiritually renewed and then literally, visually, physically renewed in the image of our Creator? Well, remember in Genesis 1 when God made people, God said, let us make people in our image after our likeness. So God created people in God's own image. In God's own image, God created people, male and female, God created them. That's what amazes me about people who want to uh, uh, subordinate women and say that they, they don't share the image of God that they should be subservient to me. This is absurd. It is in the very first book of the Bible, an attestation that God made people in God's image, male and female, God made them. We bear, all of us, the image of God. Romans 7, now that we have died to the sin that has bound us, we have been released from the law so that we may serve in a new way, the way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. The image of the Creator is the image of freedom in Christ. It is the image of spiritual renewal of our minds and our hearts. In Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. In Romans 13 at verse 14, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the desires of the flesh. Ephesians 4, 24, put on a new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, I don't think this means we're going to go down to Von Mar or Macy's or J.C. Penney's or up to Kohl's or maybe Target and spend a few hours in the fitting rooms, in, in the changing rooms, trying on new stuff till we find something that suits us. That's not putting on the image of God. No, putting on the image of God is more like the silversmith who takes the silver pot and applies rouge and polishes and polishes and then heats it. And then more rouge and polishes and polishes and heats it. And then more and more and more polishing. Those are the things that often we don't think are right when we first receive them. These are the things that sometimes make us feel like, does God even care? Does God not care how badly I'm hurting? Does God not care how lonely I am? but by faith in trust in the one we hope in, Jesus. We have seen those pretty awful things turn to right. So that when God finally takes that pot, us, that God has been polishing, what does God see? God sees God's reflection in us shining back to our Creator, the image of God in us. Robert J. Sampson, in an article called Division Street USA, says it used to be that towns actually had something called Division Street. And if you lived on the wrong side of that, you were on the wrong side of the tracks. I, I can remember, we had, a, we had a tavern in the town I grew up in that was on the wrong side of the tracks. It was on the side of the tracks where the factories were. It's where factories workers would go on payday and they would often drink a part of their paycheck away or they'd gamble a part of their paycheck away. And we were told as kids, don't ever go near that tavern, it's on the wrong side of the tracks. When I lived in Evansville, Indiana and served out at the Newburgh Church, there was a division street in Evansville and the people who lived on one side of that street were poor. 
many of them desperately poor, most of them African-American. And the people that lived on the other side of Division Street were middle class, working class, and even upper class. Division Street USA often separated neighborhood from neighborhood. But within the neighborhood, there was often solidarity, and there was family, and there was belonging, and purpose. And so maybe you aspired to move to a different neighborhood, but you had support and encouragement in the neighborhood where you lived. America has changed, and Division Street has become more divided. The divide extends to the fundamentals of well-being. On one side of the tracks is violence, poor health, teen pregnancy, obesity, fear, dropping out of school or getting on the express train from school to prison, an inequity in the distribution of goods and services. Do you, you realize that on the wrong side of Division Street, right here in our city, there is not affordable shopping. There aren't supermarkets. There aren't pharmacies. There aren't the basics that people need. And on the other side of Division Street, the side that is hope and promise, the wealth has become concentrated more than it has ever been in history, not just American history, but the history of people. There is more concentrated wealth where the good folk live than ever before. But here's the good news. My Jesus, God's right-hand man, sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, praying for us. Jesus is not praying for that shining, golden, good side of Division Street. God in Christ is praying for the prisoner, for the captive, for the meek, for the mourning, Jesus is concerned for the ones that need to be set free. And we, as the body of Christ, are called to go to that side of the division street and spend our lives as the visible image and witness of God. Charles Spurgeon, great English preacher. I, I love this story about Charles Spurgeon. They had the, the Spurgeon Tabernacle. And Charles Spurgeon was out front one Sunday morning early and, and a passerby caught him sweeping the front steps. He wasn't even dressed up in his preaching suit yet. He was sweeping the front steps. And this passerby said, hey, I hear that's a powerful church. Can you tell me what the secret is? Charles Spurgeon said, it's the 500 people from this church that are in the basement right now praying for the services that will come today when thousands will come to the Spurgeon Tabernacle. Are we praying? Are we praying for the folks on the wrong side of the track? Because Jesus is. Are we working for the folks that are dispossessed and imprisoned and, and, and slaves to things that, that they wish they could be freed from? Jesus is. Are we praying for the folks that need to know the saving grace of Jesus Christ? Because that's what Jesus calls us to do. Charles Spurgeon wrote, Satan always hates Christians when they come together, those 500 people praying in the basement. It's Satan's policy to keep Christians apart. Anything that can divide saints from each other, Satan delights in. He attaches far more importance to our godly intercourse, our common prayer, our shared purpose, our pursuit of the mission than we do. Because our coming together in the spirit is strength. It is a godly strength that nothing Satan does can separate or break. And so Satan does his best to promote Dissension, argument, disagreement, hateful words. 
Tim Keller, the founder of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, wrote, Millennials are the generation most afraid of real community because it inevitably limits your freedom to choose. Tim Keller says, if you want to be godly people, get over this notion that you have things to choose. John Wesley said, you only really have one choice, God or not God. And if you choose God, then you and I must be transformed into the image of our creator. Get over your fear of losing your choices. Dwight L. Moody, famous Chicago preacher, great evangelist, said, I've never yet known the Spirit of God to work where the Lord's people aren't together. The Spirit of God will not work if God's people are arguing and fighting and dividing and demanding their choices. Tim Keller again, a common vision can unite people of very different temperaments. We have the common vision of the kingdom of God. We have the hope of the promises of Jesus being fulfilled when we are raised with him. We have the hope that we will be as he is because that's his promise to us. Share the vision. Make your vision Jesus. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, there is so much division in our world, so much argument, so many hateful words. Paul calls the church at Colossae to put off those things, strip off those things, and to embrace the unity that only can come by being filled with and transformed by the Holy Spirit. Give us hope in Jesus. Give us the promise of the Spirit of Christ to teach us and remind us and to encourage us and change us and coach us and make us after the image of our Savior, our risen Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. We ask it for his sake. And we all say, amen.